So the last time we stopped at verse 46 of chapter 2. We continue this session from verse 47. It says, You are entitled only to actions and never to fruits. Do not consider yourself to be a cause of the fruits of action, nor let your attachment be to inaction. This verse is one of the most important verses in the Bhagavad Gita. It is this verse that gives us the idea that we should perform all action without attachment. What this has often led to is the thought and intellectual understanding I should not be attached to actions or to the fruit of actions. I should just perform. And yet, when you do not get the fruit of that action, you find yourself disappointed. Was that really action without expectation of fruit? No. When you do not get the fruit of certain action, and experience anger or sadness that clearly means that the expectation was hidden. So how can we perform action without expectation of fruit? For a lot of people trying to do this Trying to perform action without expectation of fruit proves to be a burden. We say we should perform our duty, but then our duty becomes a burden to us. So how do we learn to do this? Of course, being non-attached is a fairly high level of meditation and we can train this in our meditation when we are at our seats and we are learning to let go the impressions, the thoughts, the images, the fears, the desires that are coming into our mind. This is one way of learning non-attachment. That will then spill over into our daily lives. There is still another way. Imagine that you are learning a musical instrument. You're learning to play the piano, for instance. How would you feel if you were pressurized to perform in front of a large audience, you would feel under pressure. You have to deliver a result. Under the circumstances, you immediately fall into the trap of expecting some sort of result or fruit from that action. Naturally, you want to play well. You want the audience to be pleased by your performance. What if you're playing at home just for yourself? Those of us who play musical instruments or even like to sing, we enjoy our singing or we enjoy the music we play. We don't think, how does it sound? Is it perfect? We are just enjoying. We're not thinking about the fruit. So we can cultivate this attitude to enjoy what we are doing. In this way, our actions do not become a burden. It's not a duty that you perform 
lovelessly, rather it is something you enjoy doing. To develop this skill does take some time and practice. All skills take time. But that time is well invested. So this is the basic foundation of meditation in action, meditation in daily life. Learning to cultivate the idea that we should enjoy our lives in a way that is useful, sustainable, healthy, without harming others. This way, your actions do not create further samskaras, but they become ways for you to even attain the highest levels of consciousness. This way, our actions do not become obstacles. So, does anybody um, have any questions about this? There was a time when the there were many people, the ancient Greeks, for example, they spoke about knowledge for the sake of knowledge. They spent years and years developing theories, for example, in geometry, for no particular reason. It had no application, no major application at that time. They just did it because they enjoyed it, for the joy of it. They observed the universe around, the material world, and they put down those things. So they enjoyed it. They did it because they just loved knowledge for the sake of knowledge. What is the purpose of a beautiful flower? It blooms and then it's gone. So when we do things without expectation of rewards, we flower, we blossom. So that is what it means to be like a lotus. We can continue to the next verses. Perform actions dwelling in yoga, abandoning attachment, O conqueror of wealth, being alike to success and failure. Equanimity is called yoga. So once again, a continuation of the same idea. Perform all actions without attachment. Do not to be attached to the reward. And be alive to success and failure. A word of caution, being alike to success and failure does not mean you pretend to be insensitive to results, that you are emotionless, that you are indifferent. Rather, non-attachment is very vibrant, very lively and a joyous process. It is not dull and lifeless. So, Trying to be indifferent is not the purpose. It doesn't come from an intellectual approach. It is an insight and it is enjoying 
the action merely for the sake of that action. Some of us, for example, enjoy gardening. You may not have a purpose for gardening. You simply enjoy it. You have hobbies. Everybody enjoys either music, or painting, dance, reading a book. Why do you do these things? Because you enjoy them. But in other areas, we do not enjoy because we get attached to the result. If we can carry over that same attitude, that bhava, into every aspect of our life, then we will become wealthy. That is why Krishna calls Arjun in this verse Dhananjay, conqueror of wealth. Wealth does not mean monetary wealth, does not always mean gold or uh, kingdoms. Wealth has different meanings. It means basically prosperity, abundance. All these things come when you are not attached to the rewards of action. This stance or this attitude is called equanimity or samatvam. And this is the very basis of meditation and action. And as I mentioned in the earlier verse, a good way to strengthen this attitude of equanimity is through regular meditation. In meditation, this is what we are practicing. We are practicing to observe our thoughts, desires, fears, witness them, and in learning to do this, this spills over into our lives, daily lives, and we attain prosperity and abundance, become conquerors of wealth. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like uh, without expectation, somehow the motivation is uh, lost. So it seems kind of, uh, how to say, uh, hard to imagine how does one motivate oneself when there is no expectation out of it or something. You know? uh, it's not like, uh, so even something, let's say, as noble as I want to teach in the university or something, Somehow, internally, there are some motivations which drive you like, oh, I want this, how to say, I want the students to learn what I teach them. Or, uh, uh, so the point is, uh, how do we differentiate between expectations which are selfless and expectations which are, you know, which are going to cause us harm? Mm-hmm. In a scenario, because uh, it seems somehow very hard to imagine, I'm sorry, it seems somehow very hard to imagine how you can motivate yourself without any expectation of results from this, from any reaction, or is it possible, is my question. I think you joined in a little bit later, and you may have missed the the earlier part, when I said, um, we talked about um, the ancient Greeks who uh, developed a system of geometry, or even uh, partly science, medicine, all for the love of it. We always talked about knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Or when we play... Okay. When we perform actions like the hobbies that we have, such as musical instruments, singing, you know, whatever hobby you may have. And we do this just for the joy of it. And if we can cultivate that in all aspects of our life, then we can do this. 
For example, I'm sure that there is a, a time when you just enjoy coding, for example, as you have often put it yourself in this childlike manner. You just do it because you love it, because it gives you a certain joy. That childlike quality, we can cultivate this also in other areas. If you have it in one area, you can also cultivate it in other areas. That's a skill that has to be learned. It does take time. Like all skills, the skill will also take some time. Actually, yeah, that, that really helps a lot. Thanks. Uh, you know, that kind of that one word, like, you know, are you enjoying it like a child? Yeah. That's a question that yeah. seems like something that I can ask myself. Okay, good. Thanks. And you can change your name there. <laughs> I think the others are not with you. So you can change that. Okay, so we can go to the next verses. Okay, so that's verses 49 to 51. Action is by far lower than the yoga of wisdom, O Arjun. Seek to take refuge in wisdom. Those whose actions are causes of fruits are petty-minded. One endowed with wisdom relinquishes here both the good deeds as well as the bad deeds. Therefore, be directed toward yoga. Yoga is skillfulness in actions. The wise men endowed with wisdom indeed give up the fruit that arises from action. Liberated from the bondage of birth and its attendant cycles, they reach the state of wellness and holiness. In these verses, Sri Krishna is emphasizing once again on buddhi. What is here translated as yoga of wisdom is buddhi. If we go to the original Sanskrit, it says buddhi. And the term buddhi means having a sense of discrimination, the detachment the distance from the objects, from the actions, so that you are fully conscious and you are able to make good judgments. When your buddhi is sharp, when you are really alert and aware, you will not fall into this state of attachment and aversion. Attachment as well as aversions, they both are the two sides of the same coin. Either you get attached to certain actions or you get you feel averse to certain actions. So some of us take our normal household duties, for example. Some people enjoy cooking. They turned the cooking this chore, household chores, into an art. They make wonderful things. And the others, they, they are burdened by it. If you, get atta- if you feel that aversion, then this becomes a cause of suffering. If you learn to enjoy that, but not get attached to it in the sense, uh, oh, I want to churn out amazing dishes every day because immediately when you have that pressure simply from modern perspective you're creating stress and that is definitely not going to make you happy so without the pressure of turning out churning out wonderful new dishes every day you just enjoy the cooking then you can enjoy all your 
normal chores, household uh, duties, your duties to the family, at work, all of these in that same spirit. A person with a sharp buddhi therefore does not get attached either to the good or the bad deeds. From the highest perspective, we are talking once again here of a person who is able to witness. And since we are not established in that state, we are going through a process of learning this skill. And so we say it is skillfulness in action. Yoga is skillfulness in action. We are learning meditation in our daily life. If you are not attached to the fruit of the action, you become selfless, then you can be liberated from the cycle of birth and death and reach a state of wellness, I would say a state of prosperity and happiness. Because this would strengthen the bhava of non-attachment. It's known as vairagya, and when you're established in it, it's called param vairagya. So we see that this is a skill that we need to learn and to cultivate. We spend years and years of our life learning a profession. Even if you want to become a cook, you know, in a fancy restaurant, you spend years learning that. If you want to become an engineer, a scientist, you spend decades learning that. So we are prepared in these areas to be patient, to go through step by step, to learn this. Yet, when it comes to yoga, to our spiritual development, we get very impatient. And we keep condemning ourselves, we are not good enough. If we have a guide or a mentor, we keep writing this person and saying, oh, I'm stuck, help me, I have obstacles. We need to cultivate the patience as well to stay in this for a long term. And what is long term? In the Yoga Sutras it says, unbroken practice, practice without interruptions for a long period of time. And that long time is basically until you have attained. And that can mean for each individual a different amount of time. Some have evolved and it goes faster, some need longer. It depends also on the samskaras that you have brought with you to this plane of consciousness or existence. So there are many factors that are involved. For example, the Yoga Sutra also says the method is very important and the, and the quality of the student. If you have a poor method but a high quality of student you can still attain something but you have a very fast speedy method but a very poor quality of student you may not attain as much so there are many factors which go into this but we do need to know that this is a skill it requires patience it requires time to go through this process. For example, when you learn a musical instrument, let's take the piano. It's not so difficult to learn the basics and you say, okay, this, these are the scales, you know, there are seven octaves and you go la 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 la. Or as we'd say in Indian music, sa, re, ga, ma, pa, dha, ni, sa. 
And with that, in a couple of sessions, you can learn some basic tunes already. But is that mastery? That's not. That can take years. And even after you have practiced for years, you may not have the same skill and ease that a pianist who performs on world um, concert events has. There was a study conducted in the area of music, violins, I believe it was, violin playing, where they found <clears throat> that young children who started very early with the violin, when they started already at the age of three or four, by the time they were 18, they were like geniuses. Everybody said, oh, this is a child prodigy. So they studied that a little further and they found out the only reason they could play so amazingly well, even at that young age, was that they simply started earlier. They simply had more hours of practice. They did a calculation and they came up with the number 10,000. You need about 10,000 hours of practice in any area to become a master in that. So if you take up a sport, it takes approximately 10 hours of practice in sports to gain a mastery in that. Whatever the sport may be, whether it is skiing, football, tennis, whatever it may be. So given, of course, the fact that you are, you know, have a certain amount of talent, you need to practice. This number, 10,000, is probably also a good number for us in yoga. If you want to attain something in yoga practice, and you come up with this figure, 10,000 hours, none of us are meditating every day for hours together. If we calculate this, spending maybe two or three hours, even that's a lot, per day, you will easily come up to 30 years. It takes, takes that long to, uh, to notch up uh, 10,000 hours. If you spend seven, you know, four to five hours, I think it would take around 15 years. If you do this full time, then you can be done in about seven or eight years. When I mean full time, I mean if you have a job, you, you know, you spend about eight hours a day, seven to eight hours. If you go to university and you see the hours you, you're studying in school or at university, it works out to around six to seven hours a day. That's a full time learning or study. And if you do the same with yoga, then you're still talking about seven to eight years. So this little calculation can give you an idea of what you are looking at in terms of time to attain mastery in this. It is a skill and it has to be learned and mastered just like any other. Any questions on this? Or can we go ahead? Just a comment, uh, the idea that you have to you know, practice to gain a certain mastery, of course, also requires that you're doing the same thing all the time. Like you studying the piano only, <laughs> and not suddenly jump to violin and then to trumpet. Yes. And here also, of course, in yoga, you have so many options. So I guess this, this means you start counting when you have found your way, I would assume. Yes, thank you. That was a very good uh, observation, a very good comment. Absolutely correct. Okay, the, the counter starts, so the clock starts ticking from the time you have 
stopped collecting, stopped shopping and have settled down to one tradition, one teacher. That's why I say always one teacher, one tradition. Even within one lineage or one tradition, each teacher has a different way of doing things. Each teacher has a different emphasis. And instead of jumping from one teacher to the other or one tradition to the other, decide on one and stay with it. Often the example is used of a man who is digging for water. He is digging a well and he digs in one place and uh, someone comes along and says, you know, after he has dug one meter, said, no, 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 don't waste your time here. Dig there. That's a better spot. So he goes there and he starts digging there. After he's dug about one meter, somebody else comes and says, no, this is not a good spot. You, you dig there. And so he goes to the other spot. And this happens seven or eight times. So he's got holes everywhere, about one meter each. So he's got about seven or eight meters already. And somebody comes and says, how foolish you are. <clears throat> Had you dug in just one place, seven, eight meters, you would have hit water already long ago. And so in the earlier verse, the Bhagavad Gita referred to this example of flooding of water or, or a well. So either you stay very surface level with water flooding and you're all over the place, spread out, or have the depth of a well. And so, Joachim, thank you very much. That was a very good point. We're talking about staying with one practice, one approach, not continuously changing and dissipating one's energy in that process. We see this very often with people doing spiritual shopping, collecting. And so Swami Rama mentions this, that in the initial stages one is collecting. And the real practice only starts when you've stopped collecting, but you start practicing. You're settled down, you're convinced of one teacher, one tradition, and you have made a commitment to go deeper. And it's only then that the practice starts. All right, so we can continue to the next verses. Uh, what's that, Matthew? What do you have to say? Um, Dikshana tradition is an engagement. Uh, we cannot give it back. You see, Matthias, Diksha does not mean anything. Diksha, getting a mantra, there are people who collect mantras from many, many teachers. And having got the mantra also, it does not mean that there is a commitment from your side, because if, unless Okay, you say, I have got a mantra, I'm committed to this one person, one teacher, one tradition, that's fine. But just the act of getting a mantra does not mean much. We have an example here where we say that a teacher who gives a mantra is like a messenger. He's like a messenger. A postman, he comes and delivers a letter. So a teacher can give you a mantra. That does not mean that the teacher is in any way special. But if you stay with that teacher who not only gives you the mantra, but then also trains you and prepares you, that makes a difference. Just getting a mantra doesn't. There are thousands and millions of people who have mantras, but they're not practicing or they do not know how to practice, or they're not prepared. So, we talk about two kinds of teachers in our tradition. We say there are teachers who sow wide, and there are teachers who sow deep. To sow is to plant a seed. The mantra is a seed, a bija mantra, for example. Bija means seed. So the mantra is like a seed. The seed is planted, then it has to grow. 
But in order for a seed to grow, it has to be watered. It needs sunlight. It needs the right environment. If the soil is wrong, if the weather is bad, that seed cannot grow into a plant. So it has to be nurtured. It has to be protected. How can a student do this without guidance? So you need a teacher who sows deep, who prepares you. The teachers who sow wide, there are many these days. They have large organizations and they go somewhere and they have 100 students and on one day they give a mantra to 100 students. And there are some teachers who even give mantras uh, by email and these mantras are computer generated. So this is called sowing wide. Whether this is, it is maybe efficient, but whether it is useful, I do not know. Because what happens when you scatter the seeds on the field? The field is not prepared. A farmer always prepares the field. And then he sows the seed. If he doesn't prepare the field and he just scatters the seeds, what will happen? The seeds will be lost in the wind they will not, um, the roots will not really um, uh, take hold in the ground. So out of all the seeds that are scattered, maybe just one or two might grow into plants, may grow into strong, healthy plants. The others will just be wasted, will just die, maybe grow a little bit and then die. So this is the entire process of having a teacher, not one who merely gives you a mantra, but one who helps prepare the field, because that's the hard work. Scattering the seeds is not hard work, but preparing the field is hard work. Okay, Matthew? Shanta, does passion for what you're doing take you far? Oh yes, definitely. If you have a deep longing for this, of course it will take you far. If I am very passionate about learning the piano, how far will that take me if I don't find a teacher, if I don't practice? So yes, having a passion or a longing is the prerequisite. But that has to convert into Finding a good teacher and then practicing. Merely longing is not enough. We say, therefore, that if you have a good thought and it is not manifested, it is like abortion. It's like having a baby that dies, you know, it's abortion. So if you have a good thought, you should allow it to manifest, to materialize. So that longing which is inside must materialize in finding the teacher and practicing, attaining something. So both these are important. It's not enough to have only passion for what you want to do. But that passion or the longing will carry you. So we can continue now to verses 52 and 53. When your intellect overcomes and crosses the confused mass of delusion, then you will reach the state of dispassion concerning all that you have heard and learned and all that have ye you have yet to hear and learn. When your intellect, previously confused by the variety of teachings, remains firm and unmoving in Samadhi, then you will attain yoga. So once again, the intellect referred to here is buddhi. Due to a lack of a good translation in English or in other languages, the word buddhi has been converted to 
intellect, inner wisdom, conscience, inner voice, many different words. They all mean buddhi. They all mean the same thing. But buddhi has a wonderful quality that none of these words are conveying. The word buddhi is, comes from the same root as buddha. You know Gautam Buddha. Buddha was the enlightened one. So buddhi comes from that same root. It implies light. It implies being awakened, the awakened one. The one who is conscious. It implies, it means expansion. Buddhi also means expansion. Some of you know that some of you also know that in Sanskrit each word has many meanings sometimes up to 20 sometimes even up to 40 meanings but the words make sense somehow those meanings it is they're very subtle it's a matter of interpretation so here buddhi implies that part in you which provides you with the light which gives you the direction which is helping you to be aware and conscious. So how do you cross this delusion, this ignorance? You cross that darkness, the, uh, the delusion, the ignorance with the light of buddhi. It is that sharp discriminative intelli intelligence or intellect So having trained that, you can cross this ignorance. And then you will be indifferent to all the things that you will hear and learn from different traditions, different teachers, different schools of thought, different religions, so many different ideas. You're, you're confused by it. A normal student is confused, the average student is confused. If the student is an adhikari, is a privileged one, who has through his spiritual evolution, through the good samskaras that he has, which are now bearing fruit, has come to a point where he gets a direct insight. He has only experienced a drop, a drop of that true knowledge. But when you taste something sweet, maybe even a drop, but you have tasted all of sweetness, you know what sweetness is. So even when you've had a drop of this supreme knowledge, you know it. You can no longer have any doubts. You become firm and unmoving. You practice and then you establish yourself eventually in samadhi, in yoga, in that state of union. Okay. Shibu says in samadhi, dhi also means buddhi. Shibu, these are interpretations of different people. Who knows? I mean, samadhi is got... A lot of people who study Sanskrit, they break up the words and then they analyze them. And that was not the purpose of telling you the different meanings of the word buddhi. I am not taking the word buddhi and making, cutting it up into buddhi and studying and analyzing the words. It's just to give you an idea that buddhi is an experience which is a leading Quality is an experience that provides us with more awareness and consciousness. There's a feeling of light to it. That's a quality that it has. Um, the last thing I would want is to get into an analysis of the Sanskrit. There is, in any case, nothing like the means samadhi or, or something like that. Matthias asked, Kosha, Buddhic field. I, I don't know what your question is, Matthias. That is too vague.
please ask a more specific uh, question. Attain which kosha? Yes, and what if you attain Vijayana Kosha? That is Buddhi, yes. But that is the, the second last Kosha. You have to go through the Anamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, the um, Manomaya Kosha, and that is the part that is intuitive. And so you have to cross this somehow. So it is either through a systematic process of meditation, if you have been prepared by a teacher, using practices that have prepared you, and the preparation has also to be on the physical level, on the pranic level, on the mental level. You cannot jump all that unless, as I mentioned earlier, you have one of the chosen ones, self has chosen the self, and you have had that experience spontaneously. These are also known as spontaneous mystical experiences. They just happen. And that's the difference between a mystic and a yogi. A mystic has experienced this spontaneously, and a yogi may have experienced this spontaneously, but then he seeks a systematic method so he can attain that and stay established in it. A mystic does not have any such method. Yes, my dear, so you, you, you realize through, your, through your, your experiences that you cannot skip these levels, that you need to go through the systematic process. You don't have to be sad about it. That's a good, good insight. <laughs> So how, how do you sharpen your buddhi? Through attention, paying attention. Sometimes people use difficult words like concentration, meditation. All this puts us under pressure and you think you have to perform and reach a certain goal. The moment we talk about goals in meditation, you have completely defeated the purpose of meditation. To attain any state of deeper meditation, you have to first cultivate that quality of being um, being attentive, just paying attention. It's very simple. Anybody would like to ask anything about this before we go to the next verse? Oh, did I miss the verse? Oh no, here it is. That was a very long commentary. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> verse 54. So now Arjun asks, Arjun says, What is the description of a person of steady insight who remains in Samadhi or Krishna? How does a person of stable wisdom speak forth? How does he sit? How does he walk? Why is Arjuna asking these questions? In fact, these are questions that some of you may have also asked. These are questions asked by students who are seeking, they are looking for a teacher. They may have already realized 
that they require guidance. Many of them may have read lots of books, studied intellectually, practiced some sort of ritualism, and then realized that none of these help. Finally, after all that, they come to the conclusion that they do need a guide. So they start looking for a teacher. But how does one find a good teacher? So this is a question asked by all sincere students. If you are an Adhikari, one who has already had a deep mystical insight, has tasted the sweetness of pure consciousness, the nectar, amrit, of that high state, then your buddhi is already very sharp. Such a student, an adhikari, will have no difficulties in finding a teacher because he will see through all the others, the fakes, he will see through them very easily because his buddhi is so sharp. But what about the rest? The rest of us still are left with the question, how do I find a teacher? How does he sit? How does he walk? It's a sweet question if you think about it. This is exactly a kind of question that an, a, a student asks those who are still immature or who have little experience of teachers and traditions. <clears throat> they think that you can find a teacher based on appearances. So very often, such students, they are attracted to people with fancy titles. They are attracted to large organizations following the principal idea that if everybody uh, follows him, he must be good. You know, the herd mentality. This is not very independent kind of thinking. So a large organization, a teacher with a great following does not necessarily mean he's a, he's a good teacher. It can also mean that he has a very good marketing manager. So how else shall we find out? Is he a good teacher? So we look for costumes. Has he got a nice orange costume? How does he dress? Does he have a beard? If he doesn't have a beard, he can't possibly be a good teacher. So, based on such external concepts, many students fall into these traps and ignore the real teachers. They are fooled. They are fooled by the imitations. They say, there is gold and there is imitation gold. So it is said in the tradition. So some are fooled by the imitation. If they want imitation, then they get imitation. But if you want real gold, then you have to have some patience and you have to strengthen your longing. Practice what you know. Be where you are, practice what you know, prepare yourself. And when you're ready, the teacher will appear. It doesn't have to be a famous teacher with a huge following, with fancy titles, with nice costume and a nice long beard. It can be a very simple, unassuming person. For all you know, the teacher may be very young because age is no bar. Gender is no bar. You can be a woman, can be a, a young person. It all depends on the development. When Raman Maharishi left everything and went to Arunachala, he was a boy, a lad of 16. I don't know when he was really and truly established in the state of yoga, but even if he was, if it took him, he let it be even 10, 15 years, then already as a young man of 30 or so, he might have been an established 
uh, established in the state of yoga. Little wonder one, one called him Maharishi. So age is also not a bar. It doesn't have to be an old person. So there is no real way that one can identify a, the right teacher, a wise person, by looking at the person. We cannot judge from the external actions. Who are we indeed to judge external actions? If we do not know, if our own mind is clouded, how shall we be able to see and judge the actions of others? So rather than judging teachers, it is better to focus on oneself, study one's own behavior, one's own mind, and do what you know. One can start with very simple things, change in diet, establishing a regular practice, even if it is only five minutes a day, practice what you know. If you don't know anything else and you don't have a teacher, then just practice prayer four times a day. Everybody knows how to pray. Intuitively, we know that prayer is having a little dialogue or talking to the divine. Some people make up ready-made prayers. In the Samaya tradition, we say, nobody should make a prayer for you. Does somebody have a script or a dialogue of how a child speaks to his mother? Is there a dialogue or a script for how a little baby coos to his mother? How a mother returns the love with meaningless words? Is there a script? There is no script. So express that devotion, that longing in your own words. Establish that on a regular basis, at least twice a day, if not four times a day. And when you strengthen that longing, if you are sincere, you are worthy, the teacher will appear. Okay, so we have already spent an hour on this. Are there any questions before we end the session or any sharing? Okay, seems everybody is quite clear. Then we can end the session here. Have a nice weekend everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah, bye bye. Yes. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Most welcome. Have a nice weekend, everybody.